Welcome everyone to Defending Our Children. We are on today with a friend of mine, Gary Brugman, and he is a former Border Patrol agent, and he's dealt with several aspects of personal security, and he's got some experience out there. I thought he'd be a brilliant guest to have on to share from his unique path and perspective. Gary, welcome to the show, brother. Appreciate you coming and sharing the time with us. Hey, Craig, thanks for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Well, I know you've walked a little bit different path than I have in this world. You've seen some of the same things, but a lot of unique things. So so let's kind of walk that journey a little bit and kind of let everybody know where you started off and kind of how you ended up where you are now and gaining some of the experience and the, the observations that you've made as it pertains specifically to children and how they are vulnerable in different ways. And again, how we can protect them at the end of the day. That's kind of what we would like to end up with is how are they exposed in some ways? How are they vulnerable and what can we do about it? Well, Craig, you know, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. We were raised in Catholic school by my mom and uh, my mom and my grandma. Dad wasn't in the picture. When I was an altar boy, I was an altar boy for a long time, two different churches. I loved serving the Lord when I was a kid. It was great. Up in New York, I don't know if you remember that it started up in Boston. They had those priests that were molesting the kids and all that. They made a movie about it and everything. A lot of guys came out and spoke against it. Just a big thing. Well, you were one of those, huh? Yeah, I was, I, was, I was one of them when I was about 11 years old up in Brooklyn. But uh, got past that and never really spoke much about it afterwards. Kept it to myself. Never came out afterwards. It's not until recently that I've been starting to tell people what happened. But uh Grew up in New York City, and there's, there's there's a lot of stuff growing up in the 70s and 80s that you see, and I just had to get out of there. So in, in 1989, I joined the Coast Guard. I was in the Coast Guard for nine years. I did a lot of stuff there, and from there, I transitioned right to the Border Patrol, and that's what really, really opened my eyes there, because I couldn't believe the amount of kids that were going around being sold and rented and, and just passed around like a commodity. Yeah. But we were letting people in at the time. This was around 1999, and Hurricane Mitch had just gone through Central America. So they were coming up here, and we were letting family units in. We were giving them notices to appear and just letting them walk out in the streets. It was funny, because I think I told you a story. There was this one child who had a birthmark that looked like Florida on his leg, and there was somebody was holding him. And this was before the days of cell phones and all that. And we took note of that, and we kind of were like, hey, man, that, that kid's birthmark looks like... Florida. We gave him papers to walk away. And about a week later, we see the same kid, same birthmark on his leg with another family. We started taking pictures of all the kids. And then we realized we didn't have like a big database. So we started taking pictures and putting them up on a, on a cork board. And every time we got a family through, we had to compare the children. And it was all the time being trafficked, all the time. Wow. So this <laughs> same child was being used repeatedly by different fake family units as a type of what passport to get in because with child you're a family unit and it's easier to gain access was that the case gary yes sir because if you were a family unit they knew you were going to be able to walk into the united states that child was their key that child was a key and so a lot of times people weren't even married that were coming in well now we used to have the rapid DNA testing. And my understanding that's been abandoned down on the border now. And I have to ask the question, if your concern as mine is, is for the children, whosoever they may be, if they're being harmed through this, why could anyone condone or authorize the elimination of a rapid DNA test, which demonstrates that a child is or is not the offspring of the couple pretending to be a family unit, the biological parents of that child. Is there a reason this is done, Gary, that you can think of that that would be legitimate? Oh, back in the day, we didn't have that. And, And right now, there's no reason not to do it. But Craig, you're talking about giving them a rapid DNA test. They're not even giving them a rapid COVID test. They're not giving them anything. They're just letting people in right now in droves as fast as they can. And I still don't understand why they're doing it. There's no logical reason as to why to do it. I mean, all they're doing is tearing down the country and putting these kids in danger. The people with the cartels and the people being smuggled are using them, like I said, as a commodity. They don't care yeah. about their lives. They don't care about the children. Yeah, we we see that. And it's, it's heart-wrenching 
when you consider the safety of the little ones and what kind kind of deep psychological trauma is becoming of these children when they do survive it physically there's a lot to go into as far as what's going on on the border and your observations experience there and some of our observations together more recently but i'm still stunned and wanting to unpack what you experienced as an altar boy i think that's such an, an important thing to hit on because you know we like to have faith in our key institutions and i personally believe that it is a greater sin and a greater harm to humanity to abuse a position of public trust like a priest or law enforcement officer or so many others when you do harm through that position of public trust because it's you're able to cause more harm there because people do make themselves vulnerable to you because they do trust those positions and i think there's a greater spiritual penalty for having done that but i think there needs to be a greater physical penalty here in our country now for having done that from these positions what are your observations on that and tell us a little bit about what you saw and an experience there gary I don't know how many people this has actually happened to in my school or even in my diocese at the time. Uh, the time frame was around 1977, 78, around there. After that, I remember we had the blackout in New York City. And with everything that was happening after that experience, I just turned to the streets because I f felt I couldn't trust anybody anymore. For a long time, I felt like I was just on my own. I mean, I didn't even know what to tell my mother. I never told my mother. I've never told anybody else. I was all on my own. But like you said, public trust, it's not like it's a police officer. It's not like it's a, you know, somebody out there of authority. It's it's your priest, yeah. you know? It's, a, you know, I, I was raising Catholic school. I'm, you know, first Friday mass. I'm reading the Bible every day, going to religion classes. This guy's teaching religion classes, talking about the Lord. And then this happens. Yeah, you doing know? the opposite of what the Bible teaches, what that, Yeshua showed us and taught us to do and be. They're doing the opposite and under the banner of good. I just can't think of anything worse. And Gary, I was wanting you to share with people, again, not in too much gory detail, but as appropriately as you can, just to give people the idea of what it is that we're actually talking about. What was done to these boys? What type of be behavior did you witness there? Well, we had a big uh, fleet of altar boys. Uh, I was one of the lead guys because I, I served in two churches. And, you know, we had regular priests. Um, we had about four of them. And mind you, our Catholic school was in the same building as the church. The church was on the first floor. The school was on top and the, and the rectory was connected. So we, we came across these priests all the time. And we thought they were great guys. You know, they're always hugging, you know, giving us hugs and affection and a lot of got you know in Brooklyn and you know that time frame late seventies, a lot of us didn't have dads, <laughs> you know, a lot of us didn't have dads. And some of the younger deacons, they had two deacons there. They played softball with us and handball and everything out in the schoolyard during our recreational time. So they were kind of our big brothers slash father figures. And um, we would do after extra duty curriculars after school help out in the rectory we would help clean up the church get it ready for mass because they had ma mass every evening um, there was just a lot of a lot of kissing a lot of stuff around the ears a lot of touching and eventually it came down to undressing and fellatio on my end i was the receiver uh, when that happened and i didn't know what was going on and i actually punched the deacon and ran off and then when i went later on back to talk to a father the same thing happened with the priest and I ran off again. That's one big reason why I'm not a Catholic anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm wow. still believing. I've always believed in the Lord. I've never stopped believing in the Lord. But that's one reason I don't do Catholic anymore. I've been a member of a Cornerstone Church for 15 years, and I love it there. But there's years later, I want to say it was the 90s, when all that started blowing up, I wanted to go up there and raise my hand. But I was like, I, I've got no business being in this. I'm done. I don't want to go back and live that again. Wow. I know you're a strong man. You're greatly healed and you've gone and done great things. You're a tough dude and all this, but I want to say, I'm sorry that you experienced that and it's not supposed to happen. And I'll say that I am not here to condemn the Catholic church, but I will 
condemn that behavior. I will rebuke it and denounce it and right. condemn it. And it is, it has no place in any institution, especially one that should be, and I imagine could have been for you young men, such a positive and beautiful experience. It was perverted and distorted and evil was done instead. And I can only imagine the mind screw that it was on so many of you expecting and needing a certain genuine love, instruction, and mentoring and being preyed upon instead. How confusing that must be. Add to that, add to the sexual confusion, the confusion of the question of, am I a homosexual because I didn't fight back more? And that's what I've heard from a lot of the, the guys who have experienced this as, as young men or boys. They're like, I mean, I, I was wondering for so many years what was wrong with me, why I didn't fight harder because I didn't know what to do. And that's when I just assure them, you look, the, your brain's not even fully developed until about 25 years of age. Right. You don't have the capacity to formulate a full defense for yourself. You cannot advocate for yourself as a small child against a full grown predatory adult who knows exactly what he's after and has mastered that art of manipulation and abuse. So you first know, of all, I'll say I'm, I'm sorry for that. And I think it, it's something that, Gary, we hear about in certain federal agencies where people will screw up and do wrong. And because there's the lack of moral courage to fire that person or to demote that person, instead that bureaucratic manager that's responsible or that field office of that region promotes that person. And when there's, that's where the term screw up and move up mm -hmm. uh, comes about because, or even F up and move up is how it's commonly termed in the federal agencies. They see people that are lifelong screw ups. And instead of firing them, these managers don't want the drama. They don't want the hassle of standing up and articulating why they got rid of a federal employee and they promote them because that's the easiest way to get them out of that field office or region, let them be someone else's problem. And my understanding is that's what happens in the Catholic Church. A priest gets caught too many times molesting or raping children, and he is rotated rather than condemned and rebuked and called out. And as is biblical, you're supposed to expose the exactly. harm. You're supposed to go to your brother and, and confront them and address the issue and get to the bottom of it and put a stop to it. But instead they get rotated where they can do more harm with a fresh start. And it's just tragic. It's not okay. That is a sickness that the Catholic church deeply needs to address on a and wide scale. I'm sure it's still happening in, in some places. I mean, you know, they had a big scandal they went on in the nineties, but I mean, I'm pretty sure it's not over, but right now what scares me is even more with you know the you know the, the kids going on now. I think they're a lot worse off even than I was back then. Yes, sir. And since we've used the word Catholic, let me say that I also am aware it's not just the Catholic Church. It is other churches too where it does not belong and right. is not part of what is being taught there or anything that the Bible condones, and certainly not what Yeshua showed us to be and taught us to be. They are defiling the church. They are betraying God Almighty by doing this evil under his banner. It is an abomination before the Lord what they are doing. And we must all rebuke it and call it out and expose it and drive it from our institutions. And that's our responsibility. And that is not okay to just turn a blind eye and allow harm to continue. So I felt like I wanted to say that. After you shared that, I just felt like I got gut punched. And so thanks for letting me share that, brother. Just so you'll know, I may have not been a Catholic anymore, but I never stopped believing in God. Yeah. I've never stopped believing in Christ. He's brought me through a whole lot of stuff, even mm. worse than that. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here right now. And, you know, y'all know where I've been. Well, here's another thing. You know, we can't blame. And like you've done it right. We cannot blame the creator for what man has done wrong. You know, man falls short. And we need the creator. We need that guidance and that that mentorship and uh, influence. And that's what we're supposed to be elevating towards. So, you know, it is tragic for us to see mankind fall 
and do wrong and then blame that on the creator when uh, man is flawed and commits horrible injustice. And so it's not fair. So we've got to recognize who's who. God is pure love, pure truth, and pure light. And the, great, the, only, for that. the only regret that I have from that is not speaking out because I was scared. And if there's any kids out there that are going through anything, speak out. Tell somebody. Tell somebody, you know, so we can help you. Yeah. Tell somebody you trust who has the moral courage to do the right thing with it and not turn on you. Instead, you know, Forrest, you had something? I did, Gary. Whenever you were going through this, was there any behavior change that you might be able to share with parents that would be a red flag for them to maybe start investigating their kids' lives? I was going to say that in the last segment. From that point, I hit the streets. I became a street kid. What I couldn't protect myself from doing is in school, I went out and protected myself in my neighborhood on the streets. Did a lot of wrong things, started smoking some pot. Basically, I, I became a little street thug, you know, didn't want to come home. Was out late at night at 12 years old, was out late at night till like, you know, two, three in the morning. I get home and my mom and my grandmother would be looking out the window, waiting for me to walk up the street. And I'd show up and I'd be either either high or just wasted, got into a lot of fights. I mean, it's I was taking it out. And then once I got older, kind of quelled that down. But I was still kind of angry. And when I went through high school, I wasn't really bullied. I kind of became a bully. I protected those that were being bullied, if that makes any sense. So I, I, me and my friends, we used to beat up the bullies, if that makes any sense. It does. And, uh, yes. And that, that's, that's what we did. We just protected those that couldn't take care of themselves in school. I see two paths from those who are abused. One, perpetuate the abuse to others. Well, it was done to me, so I'm going to do it to others and somehow expect that to make me feel better and the other path is i've seen this abuse i've experienced it and i'm going to make sure it never happens to anybody on my watch exactly. and that's who you've become and that's why i appreciate your path your decision your strength of character because the strong protect the weak you know it's, it's the warriors that stop the bullies of this world and there's Maybe a lot that's of why we're friends brother Amen, brother. I, I hear respect you. that. That's the way that I saw it. You know, and again, I don't want to say that I got violent because I really didn't get violent. I just started doing wrong things and hanging out with the wrong people because I didn't want to be. I figured I did everything right. I was in Catholic school and I worshipped and altar boy and all that. And look where it got me. So I was going to do things wrong. And for a long time, I thought that the more th wrong things that I did, the more of a man that I was. Yeah. But there was that one thing that was still in the back of my mind was I know Jesus and I know God and I know what's right and wrong. So yeah. I kind of found a, a place in the middle where I can where I can still be the tough guy and protect those at the same time when, you know, doing what we did. And yeah. which is why we still do it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, let me ask you this. For those out there who have children who are altar boys or are going to be what would you say to them? How would you recommend that they safeguard their children? There's only one thing that I can say, and it, I got it right here. It says, trust no one. Always, tr always trust in the Lord, but never trust a human being. No matter how good your priest or anything may be, keep a close eye on your kids. Watch their behaviors. I wouldn't let nobody be alone with my child. The way, and mind you, this was the 70s, so it was different. We did a lot of things as kids that we don't even let kids do now. You know, but keep an eye on your kids. You need to know exactly what they're doing. And if they don't like it, if they think you're in their business, too bad. You're protecting them. Yeah. I've always you know? been an advocate of trust, but verify. Um, exactly. I like, nan I like nanny cams. I like the idea of being able to review the footage just to make sure your child's been okay. There hasn't been any surreptitious, covert, you know, harm done to the little one. So yeah, I agree. And just keep an eye on your kids. That's all you can do is watch them like a hawk whatever means you can you know and when i was in the border patrol craig i mean the kids that we found out in the brush by themselves walking around that had been abandoned two three-year-olds we found a five-year-old taking care of a two-year-old they said they've been out there for two days can't imagine a five-year-old and a two-year-old out in the brush for two days i came to work one time and i kept hearing this noise and i was like what is this noise i finally figured out it was two kids sleep under the supervisor's desk that had been found in the brush we had nowhere to put them we we couldn't put them in a tank with everybody else. We couldn't put them in. So they put them in the office, made a little bed for them under the desk, and that's where they were sleeping. They were snoring. 
They hadn't slept in days. Oh, man. And it's just, you know, this world that we live in. I mean, you've seen the videos out there of kids just being left out in the middle of nowhere screaming, don't leave me, don't leave me. We got to protect these kids. Yeah. Can you imagine the stress on a small five-year-old child trying to keep a two-year-old alive with no water, no food, no provisions? I, I, I have found them. I found them and it's heartbreaking. Well, look at the terrain, the wildlife. I mean, it is not the best of circumstances for those kids to be in. I mean, there's rattlesnakes, there's scorpions, there's coyotes. Everything you touch sticks to you. That is nuts. And the cartels and the smugglers and the coyotes, they have no regard whatsoever for these kids. Once, if, if the kids are slowing them down, they'll leave them behind. You know, if it's a young female, they, they don't really care. They'll do what they want with her. People send these kids across and don't even go with them because they think that the kids will make it and then they'll be the anchor children and they can send for their parents. Right. This is their mentality. All right. Yeah. They'll send a five-year-old to go, you know, try to get them citizenship. Yeah. So fast forward, let's go. What did you see in the Coast Guard? Uh, the Coast Guard, you did some stuff. I imagine a lot of drug interdiction and things like that. Was there anything involved in the children or not uh, so much in that institution? Didn't, didn't see it a lot in the Coast Guard. During the Haitian in 92, when they first overthrew Aristide down in Haiti, we were rescuing all the boats that were, everybody was leaving Haiti and we bringing them on board ship. And we were trying to rescue one time and some dude actually just threw a baby from one boat to another and then like a football, pass it to us. And it just really, really made me mad because I get it, they're trying to save this baby, but we were on our way and they're just tossing it in the high seas. They didn't really see a lot of our trafficking when it came to that. One of the big things I did in the Coast Guard was I responded to a TWA Flight 800, which crashed over Mauritius back in 96. We responded to that, but really didn't see a lot of tra child trafficking. It's all a lot of drugs and uh, organized crime. But not really a lot of trafficking in the Coast Guard. I saw a lot of more in the Border Patrol. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your service there. I've always heard that the Coast Guard is a, a great way to serve, and uh, and it's a good job. You know, it's I good, love it, man. good culture I love there. It. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about Border Patrol. You know, what was that like for you, and and going and serving your country on the border, and you know, what kinds of things did you see with children? How were they vulnerable? What people need to know about how we can safeguard well, the, the children better from it you know the thing is that when when it comes to children on the border they're a commodity you know other than us nobody really cares about them because they're used as a ticket they're used as a key they're a ta they're tangible you know they're a tangible item that can be traded back and forth and reused you know like like yeah. for trafficking like they're letting family units in so there, there'll be some a family in mexico that's got a toddler and be like hey i'll lend you my kid for x amount of money and they just recycle them back and forth. There'll be somebody here that picks the kid up, brings them back to the other side, and they'll reuse them again. And it doesn't know what's happening, you know. Yeah. And, but after a while, they, they the toddler will get used to seeing different people, so it doesn't even react anymore. Yeah, you know. And, and they uh, they drug them as well. You know, yeah. nowadays they drug them. And, and speaking of that, I think we spoke about this once: the organ harvesting thing that's going on down there as well. I mean. If you look it up online now, it will say it's a myth. But I remember because I had the memo in my hand that if we saw a child sleeping coming through the checkpoint in like a car seat or in the back seat or something, we had to wake up the child just to make sure it was alive because they were surgically removing their insides and putting, and as the memo said, an industrial zipper in, the, in their corpse and packing them with dope to bring dope across. And if you look that up, on Google, it'll say it was a myth, but I saw the memo. I woke kids up because we were ordered to. So there's no remorse or consideration when it comes to children on the border. It's wide open. Well, I first started hearing about the organ harvesting internationally probably 15 to 20 years ago. And it's That's more recently, it. yeah. Then with Sarah Carter's story and expose on that, she's witnessed and unpacked quite a bit more i'd love to follow up with her more and, and learn the the evidence that she's got and kind of help expose that because i think that's fantastic work but what a dark and ugly aspect of humanity that to either kidnap people or take and abduct them and involuntarily take organs 
out of them. You know, you wake up and you're stitched up like Frankenstein and you've got a, a kidney gone or whatever they do. And even if you survive it, you know, a lot of them, they, they don't even try to salvage the, I was gonna say, the and life. They just, they just murder them and they take everything right there and, and sell them for parts like a chop shop with a stolen car in a way, but just much more evil. And just, it's hard for people to contemplate and comprehend, you know. What, I don't have, I'll have to tell you about how ruthless and evil the cartels are on the other side of that river, on the other side of the border. They don't give a damn about anybody, about you, me, anything. And they'll do what they need to do for money, you know. All these cartels down there, they're, they're considered criminal organizations. I consider them terrorists, and they're just plain evil with the things that they do. Well, Jason Jones is trying to get them designated as terrorist organizations, which they are, but we don't have the politicians with the moral courage or the intent Correct. to do so. So, so far it hasn't happened. I believe it needs to happen because I understand the war chest that can be cracked open against those that are destroying so many lives. Amen. And uh, we could, we could have security and peace again, but you know, so many people that are benefiting from the way that it is the corrupt status quo that they will not allow it to change they will not authorize solutions it's very upsetting to witness and have somebody recommend a solution and have major politicians decline it and say no nah, we're not going to do that what resource do these kids and these people have coming across the border what the children i mean their children they they don't have a voice they're just being passed around you know, and the only word that keeps coming to my head is like a commodity, like a commodity. Yeah. You know, that's, well, that's, that's exactly what, what it is. They're they're uh, being uh, bought and sold and traded, exactly, and and abused like you would any other commodity in any other criminal enterprise. It's so dark and disheartening to witness, and man, I'm trying to rally people against it and say, "Hey, look, man, the the harm is happening. Let's have we the adults stand up and be assertive." and demand and take action to change it. And so many people just put their hands over their ears and say, oh, I just can't. Oh, children, I just can't. My response to that is, oh my God, the children are already suffering this. If you, the adults say that you just can't, who's going to defend the little ones? Where does that leave the children already suffering? So, you know, we, the adults yeah. have to be, be responsible and have the courage enough to stand up and just fix things. I mean, just we're not talking about being Superman, just getting back to a culture that's protective of children. That's, that's all we're talking about here. You know, the, the desire that's grown all over the world, especially in this country, all over the world, the desire that's grown for young children is disgusting. I mean, I know it's been there for a long time. I've been there, but I've never seen it so blatantly out in the open like this. It's like evil has this big grip on Mother Earth right now. They don't really care. They don't really care. It's like... They're doing it and there's nothing you can do about it. We're doing it and what? It has yeah. to be, get it to stop. Well, Jonathan Kahn wrote a book and he's doing a series of uh, talks about it. The book is Return of the Gods. And that's gods with a small g, meaning demons. And essentially what's happening now is by driving God out of our culture here in the United States, we've left a void. And spiritually, that void gets filled with something. And so these right. ancient demon gods that were written about in the Old Testament that people used to sacrifice their children to, those same demon gods are having their way here. And that's what this entire war of children is is centered upon. And people need to know that so that we can do something about it. Gary, what are some other scenarios you've seen? What, what do people need to know about children, border security, how they're trafficked, the organ harvesting, all of it? What do you think? People need to most know. Well, that basically that it can happen to you. A lot of people think this will never happen to me. I'm not there. I'm not on the border. This, this doesn't concern me. This won't happen to me and my family. It can happen to anybody. You know, your, your loved one disappeared. It doesn't matter if you're at an amusement park. It doesn't matter if you're at the mall 150 miles into the United States. It can happen because traffickers are everywhere. And, and you know that. If you see something, and I hate to use the cliche, but if you see something, say something. And it doesn't matter how little you think it is. You can do a whole bunch to help people. Y'all know uh, my buddy Joe Pags on the radio. Back in 2016, his daughter was taken by uh, somebody that she worked with. And they took off in the vehicle. She had left the school, never went to school. 
and ended up leaving with this guy, an older guy. He was 24 years old. I think she was 16 at the time. They were heading for Mexico, heading for the border. And, you know, Joe was tripping. I mean, it's it's his baby. He loves his family. He, he's got a whole house full of girls. He's got five daughters and his wife. It's a whole house full of women. At the time, this was in 2016, I was in a motorcycle accident. So I was lying in bed. I couldn't move. I had broken legs and broken collarbone and everything. Me and Joe started talking and he asked me for my help. There wasn't much I can do for my bedside. So I got on the horn and I said, let me see what I can do. I knew retired agents down in, in San Diego. I knew current agents. I knew a bunch of customs guys. I knew a couple of CHP guys. And between my connections and the people that he knew, we kind of coordinated and they were trying to figure out where they were going to cross. And it was either going to be, you know, somewhere between our central sector and TJ or Imperial Beach somewhere. I think they crossed through El Cajon, went into Mexico, and they got him on the, on the Mexican side. And, and when, once they brought him back to the bridge, he had some Border Patrol agents there that took custody of her and kept her safe until he went, was able to go over there and go get her. You know, I mean, but that's something that I did for my bedside. You know, and like I said, I didn't do much. I just made as much phone calls as I could and coordinated, trying to figure out where it was they could possibly cross. You know, there have been people that seen, I had a friend call me the other day, says, hey, there's this truck going down the road and it's got like a string blouse sticking out the back of the, the back door. Is that some kind of sign? I was like, dude, I'm four hours away from you. Call 911 and see what it's about. You know, I mean that if you see something, do something about it, because as little as you think it may be, it could save somebody's life. Yeah, that's true. You don't want to send just petty uh, claims to law enforcement, but I've talked to law enforcement about things like, you know, if a woman's being followed throughout town and, and this guy's obviously following her, is she welcome to call them and, and have them make a stop and find out what it's about? And they said, yeah, if it's a legitimate situation like that, we encourage that. So yeah, that's that's how things get done is people being alert, situationally aware and making the effort. You know, look at so many people, Americans and Afghan allies and assets, interpreters and intel assets over in Afghanistan who were abandoned and left for dead there that are being dragged out of their homes and murdered, tortured to death every day there are being brought out and rescued from people who are simply doing it from home. Like you said, you had two broken legs, broke a collarbone. You couldn't get out and run around. But a lot of times it's just the coordination of assets and finding people who, who can the network and all other aspects of it. Yeah. Connecting the different, connecting the dots, connecting the people that need to coordinate to make these things happen. That's a fantastic contribution. So Folks never think that you can't do it just because you may be elderly or disabled or have a hectic schedule or something. There's always a little something we can we can do, even if it's connecting people that can do other parts of it. It's a fantastic contribution. So and, you don't have to and, save and the day enough, all by yourself. And oddly enough, it's almost like it's almost like when you're trying to fundraise or for a cause or something. And people are like, well, I don't have a lot of money. Well, every little dollar counts. Every little every little bit counts, especially when you're trying to save somebody's life, you know, going yeah. from being traffic. Well, I saw this detail. That might be the missing detail that they need. Yeah. So we champion and really celebrate people who do make those phone calls. They, they photos, they take video and they submit those to law enforcement and even to NGOs like us, the where we can look and see who's involved, what's going on and help make a rescue or an arrest. It's a, it's a very good thing. The more the, the more savvy the populace is, to the crime, the more they know what to look for, what constitutes yeah. real evidence and what's just superfluous, you know, waste of time. So uh, that's another thing we can really educate our people out there on what to look for. And that's why we've got our website at Vets for Child Rescue so loaded up with information, evidence, and what to look for and how to report it so that people can learn and be more savvy citizens on the lookout for children. Because in the case of child trafficking, it's a covert crime. You know, right. it's not like they have a bus, you know, child trafficking bus, you know, stay <laughs> exactly. 30 meters back. It's, you know, they're moving children in and out of Airbnb homes in and out of hotels, motels right under our noses. And we don't even know a lot of times what to look for, what signs and symptoms constitute this, this crime. 
how's this happening on industrial scale? Well, it's been done through secrecy. And we are done. We are undone through a lack, a lack of knowledge. So and knowledge is power if you know how to utilize it. It is. It is. It's, and it's not only power, it's also very powerful. You know, the more the more you know, the more you educate yourself, the more you see things, you know, even on the street. And it doesn't have to be, like you said, covert. Covert could be out in the open, Craig. Covert could be out in the mall. Somebody's got a girl or a child and they're walking away and, you know, right in front of you and the child isn't saying anything. They don't know. They're scared. You know, covert, covert doesn't mean that you don't see him. It means it'd be right in front of you. Yeah. Well, we've seen increasingly when the corrupt are not afraid of being caught, when the law is not being enforced due to a, a number of problems, that chain of events that lead to our laws not being enforced, then the predators become emboldened and they'll do it more overtly right in your face. Because they're not worried about getting caught. It's easier and they'll just do it right out in the open. We see that in all over the place. I started to say we see that in D.C., but I won't say that today. Well, <laughs> also, you've got everybody, you could be doing something. Everybody's got their noses in their phones and it could be happening right next to you and you're not exactly. paying attention. We, we need to put our phones down while we're in public, look around, pay attention, especially if there are kids, observe. What a great place to learn. I mean, I'm a people watcher. I like watching people and I learn every day something from watching people drive or watch them in the mall or at a restaurant. I'm always looking for detail. And here's the thing. I'm not an expert. I've sat in restaurants with you guys and all sorts of stuff is going on around me. I'm clueless. And then y'all educate me. I'm like, wow, yeah. I feel like you can always learn. Yeah. Yeah. Look, situational awareness in third world countries, there's a lot that's going wrong and there's a lot of harm and road hazards and everything else. And they adjust to it much more quickly than Americans because we're kind of lulled into this dulled sense of awareness and a lot more harm can happen i.e if there's a traffic light out you're going to have a big pile up in the united states whereas overseas are really they would just slow down and make do because it's normal let's talk about more the the personal security i know you've done quite a bit of that work i've i've seen you at multiple venues myself and i think you you're kind of like i am in that if you see a void in somebody's security that you know you just kind of start filling that gap and making sure they're okay and I've had several friends do that for me over the years. I'll be making public speeches and I'll, I'll know they're like scanning, like they're safeguarding me. And I appreciate it. And uh, I think we all kind of tend to do that. So with that being said, you know, so what are some things that you've seen or done that, that you think would empower people knowing about personal security, especially as it pertains to the little ones? Well, like you say, Craig, I've been doing a lot of uh, uh, security work, executive protection, a licensed PPO, personal protection officer here in Texas, and a private investigator. Still get my feet wet in the private investigator part, but I want to be able to help everybody as much as I can with, with that asset. But keep your eyes open. I would, you know, I want to tell everybody to keep their eyes open, and especially in the world we live in now, never let your guard down. Never let your guard down. You're right, because like when you said, like you're saying at these events, when I'm in an event, it's hard for me to turn off you know, yeah. and just sit back and enjoy an event, you know, because I'm always on guard. So I read, I enjoy the event more actually standing there and watching and being that guardian, that protection officer, than sitting there and, you know, raw and, and enjoying the event. I can do the event just fine, making sure everybody's safe. You know, I found it amusing. Uh, last time we were at an event and we were walking off and security was like, wait, wait, you need me to go with you? I said, no, he's got me. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like oh, I'm so a man's bodyguard wow <laughs> I got yeah, that, was a, out of that was a funny moment and I did appreciate it too you know and it, hey you, you know how it is man wherever we go we got to what look out for each other yeah um, even if it's just an additional set of eyes you know we have predatory eyeballs on the front of our heads not like prey on the sides of our heads so we can only look one direction at, at a time and we do need to physically scan left and right to pick up more and that's why it, a two-man team is is so important. So, exactly. yeah, I mean, exactly. children the same way, man. If they're out somewhere, you know, if they learn to keep their little heads up and just make sure they understand their surroundings, and there's a reason for people being where they are and doing what they're doing. And if children know that, they can kind of ask themselves whether it makes sense if certain adults are approaching them or in close proximity to them out at a park or 
wherever it may be at a mall, follow them too closely or whatever. So I, I like teaching people, you know, the, those basic vigilance disciplines on staying safe and just being situationally aware, you know, and a lot of it, it's just that it's a discipline. It really is. It's a, it's a trained behavior of getting your head up and out of the cell phone. Whenever you walk into a new space, I like to say new hallway a room that you haven't been into or walk outside again from inside, simply take your head and lift it up, you know, horizontal and scan all the way left and right. And just see what's going on there. See if everything's copacetic. See if it's relaxed and everyone's okay. Or if something is causing a disturbance, if somebody is running or somebody is, their body language indicates that they're very serious or angry or or may have ill intent approaching you or someone else. These things are, are what you're going to want to see. And always read the hands. What are they doing with their hands? This kind of thing really allow you to uh, detect a threat earlier on and have a lot better chance of surviving right. it, doing something about it. Don't don't be on your cell phone when you're walking through a parking lot or a parking garage. One of the places where a lot of things are happening lately are gas stations. Because you got your keys in your car, you're, you're gassing up your vehicle, and you're vulnerable right there. Male, female, children alike. People are just rolling up on you in vans, coming up from behind the pump, and either robbing you, assaulting you, kidnapping I mean, it's happened in a lot of gas stations. Of course, alleyways, you know, that a lot of these housing complexes have alleyways now in the back. I don't know why I've never liked alleyways, but keep, keep your eyes open. Be alert. Like you said, get your head out of your phone, scan, you know, and make it a point that as you're walking to and from somewhere, don't be on your phone. You know, they used to say, who would be easier target? Somebody with their hands in their pocket, looking down, just walking like this. Or somebody who's got their chest out, shoulders back, and chin up. Who would be the easier target? Obviously, the one oblivious with his hands in his pocket. I mean, and if something happens, one thing that I like to tell people is, especially children, don't be afraid to make noise. The first thing they're going to tell you is, don't scream. Scream. <laughs> scream. That, that'll, that'll chase them away. That'll make them fear and run away. You know, if you see somebody coming towards you, you know, put your hands up. Say, get back. Because the motion itself, if it's seen on a camera, somebody sees it from inside, you know, somebody can come to your aid. Yeah, it tells some of the story, as does a, a scream or a yell for help, because a lot of people that are abducting children don't want anyone to know. And if a child yells out and screams for help and puts their hands up in a defensive position, tries to run this kind of thing, that translates. I mean, that communicates across that playground or that park or parking lot or mall or whatever it may be alleyway for others that may be within visual or earshot of it so that they can recognize. And like you said, uh, the security cams can pick that up. So then they could at least identify the perpetrator. Okay. This guy is the one that took the child. Cause you can see the child respond very negatively right there. And uh child's trying to get away and the guy had to actually grab him. So yeah, you don't want your child to just willingly go with the stranger and so many times, Gary, it's not stranger danger, it's uncle danger or priest danger or scout leader danger or something like that that are molesting or harming these children. It's just so, so tragic. But, you know, I think it's it's a matter of fact that we need to educate our children on how to speak up and who to speak up to. And, and as we do personal security, Craig, as always, when you're in a situation, even before you're in that situation, if you find yourself in a situation, look for an out. If you're not in a situation, try to find a way out. Leave yourself an out. If this happens, I'm heading this way. If I'm protecting this person, something goes down, I'm taking them out that way. You know, leave yourself an out. Have some kind of a plan, even if you're driving down the road. Because as in Victor's case, they ran him off the road. You know, leave yourself an out as to where to go, wherever you're yeah. going. That's what, that's one of the big things that I think is necessary. And this whole private security journey has actually been really good because I was out of the game for a long time. It brought me back in and I've been able to do a lot of things I never thought I'd, I'd do ever again. It's fantastic being able to serve people again. Yes, sir. Well, having a, an out, in other words, a direction or a refuge that you can go to if something should go wrong is a smart principle no matter what you're doing. I've saved myself 
driving on the highway utilizing that principle. But you know, those of us that go through several, you know, high speed driving tactical driving schools we learn this kind of stuff and you set your mirrors up properly you're always scanning in a situation where and i had a 18 wheeler blow a tire and swerve and he, he would have crushed me in a tiny rental car i was in and i was able to grab a lane left immediately without looking because i, I was already aware that there's nobody in that left lane so anyway that that'll save your hide gary it's been a great show sir i appreciate you coming we got to close it out let people know where to find you and support what you do I'm on, uh, my main platform is uh, I'm on Instagram at, at Gary.Brugman. I'm on Truth Social, Gary Brugman, Facebook, Gary Brugman. And I got a website, GaryBrugman.com. Not that hard to find. If you Google my name, you'll be able to find it. All righty, sir. Thank you for your service and your contributions here, folks. I hope you'll join us again next time on Defending Our Children. <laughs>